Good evening, church family, and welcome visitors. This is the evening worship service for the Holmes Old Church of Christ. Before we begin our worship service, uh, will you bow your heads and pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer, thanking you for blessing us to see another day, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will bless the service, that the things that are said and done and sung are pleasing in your sight, Lord. Uh, bless Brother Stan as he delivers the message, and uh, Lord, just continue to protect us during these difficult times in this world and, and bless us with health and safety. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. First song is, We Praise Thee, O God. <clears throat> we praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of light who has shown us your Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the God of all grace, who has bought us and sought us and guided our ways. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled as fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Amen, church. <clears throat> Our next song uh, before the lesson, Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross. <clears throat> Jesus keep me near the cross, there's a precious fountain free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain in the cross in the cross be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the trembling soul love and mercy found me there the bright and morning star sheds its beams around me in the cross in the cross be my glory ever till my rapture 
injured soul shall find rest beyond the river near the cross O Lamb of God bring its scenes before me help me walk from day to day with the shadows o'er me in the cross in the cross be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Amen, church. Thank you, Brother Raj, for that song service. <clears throat> for those of you that are tuning in, you may notice it looks a little different. Apparently, during that little power outage we had this morning, it, it kind of knocked some of our technology out in the auditorium, and hopefully we'll get that fixed, but we had to move over to the fellowship room, so so maybe that uh, make, makes the difference as to why it looks a little different for you today. Um, bear with me, uh, because we had to kind of do this at the last moment and move over here to the fellowship room, I don't really know what's going on behind me, so I'll constantly probably be turning around, but just bear with me at home and as we do that, but... Uh, but we are going to continue to look through our First John series. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn to First John. We finished the first chapter now, and we're looking to the second chapter at this point. And so I just want to remind you where we're at. Uh, we we'll give a quick review. Last, uh, the last couple of messages we looked at in John chapter one, we looked at the lessons that John pro provided: that God is light. And the fact that because God is light, he challenges us to walk in the light. And uh, without God, uh, you are in complete darkness. If you remember that discussion and that lesson. And then we also talked about how uh, there is absolutely no darkness in God at all. And so when you walk in the light, you receive many benefits from that light, including fellowship with other Christians and fellowship with even God himself. We covered all of that uh, in chapter 1, and now we're going to chapter 2. And in, in chapter 2, we're just looking at verses 1 through 6 here uh, this evening, and then we'll continue on next week. But just those six verses uh, for this evening. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn there, and we're going to look at verse 1 at the right now. Oh, we're going to look at verse 1. There we go says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. Now, there's a whole lot to look at just in this verse alone. Uh, first thing I, I want you to, to understand is that, that John here makes it clear that he wishes all Christians would not sin. Uh, but he also makes it clear that it is inevitable that we Christians are going to sin. I mean, he, you know, he says, I, I don't want anyone to sin. But in case we do, we have this thing, the advocate. And by stating he's, he's writing so that they may not sin, John is stressing the importance of sin. I think sometimes we, those of us that have lived our life in Jesus Christ, we, we have the blood that washes white snow. Sometimes we may take that for granted, and we might, when the times we sin and, and mess up and we know we have forgiveness, maybe we don't see the heaviness, the importance of sin. But John here, he, he, when he writes, I wish no one would ever sin. I wish no one would sin. I, he says, if, if, I wish that no one may ever sin again. But, but he's showing how important the concept of sin is. It is something to be concerned about, Christians. Yes, we have forgiveness, but let us never take sin lightly. Because sin, what John is letting us know here, 
Sin is not a trivial matter. It's never flippant. It's not something we just, oh, well, and move on. I mean, you know, we got to understand that sin causes separation. Yes, we have the blood of Christ that, can t- that keeps us in fellowship. But John is saying, we, I wish we didn't have to have an ad- advocate, but we do. This is, should be, this, this desire John is stressing here, it should be the desire for all of us who are Christians. This, we should, yes, we're going to fall. Yes, we're going to make, we're going to, to have sin uh, just because we live in this fallen world, but that shouldn't be our desire. We should all desire, like John, to not sin and to get rid of it and, to, and, and try our best not to. But, with that being said, we should have that desire within our hearts, but in our weakness of the flesh, sometimes we're going to do what our desire of not sinning, that we're going to do what we desire not to do. And this is exactly the struggle that even the Apostle Paul talked about. Now, the Apostle Paul, he had an amazing conversion. He met Jesus face to face on the road of Damascus, and he knows he's been called. He knows that he's, he's met Jesus and had this miraculous uh, giving of the word unto him. And yet he says, in Romans seven fifteen, he says this. He says, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. See, and this is, this is, this is where all of us are. John says, I wish nobody would ever sin. I wish sin the Christians would never did. And we should all have that desire. Paul says, I have that desire. I, I wish I didn't do what I do. But you know what? I end up doing what I hate sometimes. And that's the way we all are. But as long as that desire to always be with Christ and to not sin, if our desire to not sin is there, that's where Jesus is going to come to our rescue. See, the heart's desire is to not sin, but yet we do. And John gives us, it gives us understanding, it gives a teaching here that there is help. When we, like Paul, do what we hate to do, because we live in this fallen world and sometimes we just sin, when we do that, John says we have this great thing called the advocate. And I want to talk a little bit about what that word advocate means. Literally in, in Greek, it means a defense lawyer. And, and I just think, that what, a, what a marvelous word to use here. As a, uh, Demosthenes, an old, an old guy back in the ancient days, he, he wrote that, that, that this word, that this word translated as advocate here that we're talking about, he says, to us it's used, to us Greeks, he says, to us in Greek, it's used to designate the friends of the accused who voluntarily step up and personally urge the judge to decide in his favor. I love the way Demosthenes, uh, Demosthenes wrote that. Uh, it, it, you know, it just, it's a friend who steps up and convinces the judge on your behalf. And he, this is the word that is used here. When we have a desire not to sin, and yet we do, Jesus is our friend. And he steps in to defend us when we do sin and when we need that lawyer. See, every sin we do, every one, that's why John says, I wish we didn't, because every single one re- requires separation. But every time when, when God knows, when Jesus knows our hearts and he, will, and he knows that our desire is not to, he's going to step up and approach the judge and plead for us. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Aren't you encouraged by that? I want you to close your eyes if you want to, but imagine a trial and every single sin that you do, the ones you do today, the ones you do tomorrow, the ones you've done in the past, every sin you do demands a trial. Every single one. Every one demands a trial. And the persecutor, or the prosecutor, I should say, the prosecutor in this trial room, he stands up and he points at me and he points at you and he says, that man is guilty. He's guilty of 
this, 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 that, or whatever it is, whatever sin it is you committed, he says this man is guilty, and you, the accused, you have no ability other than to say, I'm guilty. I admit it. I'm guilty. I did it. I have no excuse. You can't give excuses to God. You can't give reasons to God that justify any sin. So the only recourse you have is to say, yep, I'm guilty. And then the judge slams that gavel down and says, guilty is charged. He is to be sentenced to death and the full wrath of this righteous court is due him. But then, even though that is what should happen with every sin we do, then Jesus steps up. Jesus, that friend, that advocate, he steps up and he says, Dad, this one belongs to me. I paid the price. I took the wrath. I paid the punishment for him. I took care of that sin for him. And then the judge slams the gavel down again and says, Guilty, it's charged. The penalty has been paid. And the prosecutor, the, the accuser, you just see him. He goes crazy and he says, That's it? Are, are you not at least going to put him on some probation? Find him, punishment, slap his hand, something? And the judge looks at that prosecutor and says, No, there's no reason for any punishment at all because the penalty has been completely paid by my son. My son, this, this one belongs to you. I release him completely into your care. Case closed. And he slams the gavel yet again. In this scene that I want you to imagine... I want you to realize this occurs each and every time that you sin and your heart is right and you're confessing your sinfulness. You're confessing, I, I'm a sinner. I need help. Jesus, thank you for being my Savior. This is, the, this is the, the imagery that John is giving us that plays out every time. Thank God. We have the advocate. Look at verse 2. John writes, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's why I said the judge can slam his gavel and say, No punishment, because he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but the whole world. World, Do you realize what that verse just said? I mean, that's an amazing verse. Jesus, the advocate, he stands ready to be your advocate for everyone. He stands ready for all people. No matter what race, culture, age, gender, status, or wealth that you may or may not have, it does not matter. Jesus says, I'm here. I'm ready to be your advocate. He is ready to advocate for the whole world. All you have to do is let him. All you have to do is admit that I am a sinner and I need Christ and believe in him and be, submit yourself unto baptism. Confessing your sin and submitting yourself in baptism. That is how you enter his body. That's how you submit and enter into his, his cleansing blood. That's how you come into the access of that blood that washes all of, all of the things away. And then he, you can live inside of him for, for, all of, for all of eternity. And he'll be that advocate for you until the day you die. Look at verses 3 through 6. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly perfected in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. 
The evidence of fellowship with God is that we keep his commands and obey. This is what John just says. John, read verse 5 again. If anyone obeys his word, the love for God is truly perfected in him. This is how we show evidence. The, the, the fact that we talked this morning about the fruit and presenting fruit so people can see. Well, he says the evidence, that fruit, the people to see, the evidence that you're in fellowship with God is that you obey and keep his commands. People need to see you obeying and keeping God's commands. This is why when you're at work and people want to go outside party, you say, no, I'm not going to do that. You present that I'm going to obey. When, when people are out there doing all kinds, they're stealing, they're cheating on their taxes to, so they don't have to give money to the IRS or, or the government, you know, whatever it is. There's all kinds of things going on out there and you stand up and say, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I'm going to live differently. I obey Christ. That is the evidence that you're in fellowship with God. Loving obedience is the natural result of fellowship with God. Loving obedience is the natural result of fellowship with God. If you're walking in the light and you understand the benefits and you understand what Jesus does for you, you understand that he's the advocate that is standing up for you when he doesn't have to, that he died for your sins when he didn't have to, when you understand all of that. And it's so easy to love and, and to follow his word when you understand the benefits. It's easy to follow someone who does those kinds of sacrificial things to show they love you. But, once again, I want to remind you, although we have that advocate, we do not need to become careless about sin. Now, how are we supposed to be able to distinguish between a Christian and anyone else in the world? Well, simply put, by their obedience to God's word. This is what John is teaching us here. Those who say I have fellowship with God, I know God, but then does not follow God's commands, John just said he is a liar. Obedience is the evidence of that fellowship. And the word of God is perfected. You see that word perfected? That word perfected is critical here. I want us to really focus on this word perfected. See, when we are in loving obedience to everything God tells us to do, we're in loving obedience to Jesus, it says we are perfected in God's word. And why that word is so critical here is because this word, it carries the idea of constantly maturing. We should all be maturing toward perfect love and obedience every day. We all may stumble and fall. I'm not saying we're all not going to sin anymore. We will stumble, we will fall, and we will sin. We may slip up every now and again, but you should be learning from those mistakes and maturing and trying to do better. That's what we should be trying to do. That's, that's what this word means. We will never reach perfection, but we are constantly working on perfecting. We're trying to be perfect, even though we never be there. We're constantly getting closer and closer. If perfect is here and we're walking that line, we should constantly be getting there, even though we may not ever get there. We may fall back, but we want to keep getting there. We want to keep trying. And that's exactly what this word means when it says perfected. It means that constant striving for. Charles Spurgeon, in his... Uh, in his commentary on 1 John in this section. He wrote this paragraph, and I thought it was a wonderful paragraph I want to share with you. Spurgeon writes, The Christian no longer loves sin. It is the object of his sternest horror. He no longer regards it as a mere trifle, or plays with it, or talks with it with unconcern. Sin is dejected in the Christian's heart, though it is not ejected sin may enter the heart and fight for dominion but it can't sit upon the throne I just thought that was beautifully written how, and, and that's exactly what John is trying to say here I wish that nobody ever sinned but I know you're going to and so here's the advocate but don't take that for granted constantly when you sin learn from it and try to be better 
And then if you fall again, learn what you did wrong and try to be better. And that's the constant striving of a Christian. That's what Paul said. Oh, I wish I, I, I did what I want to do, but sometimes I, I do what I hate. So don't we all feel like Paul sometimes? And so John ends this section simply by saying, with the concluding statement that he used to begin the section. How he kind of began this section, he kind of closes in there. He, he says, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Kind of gone in a full circle. Live in the light. And now he says, live as Jesus did. Jesus lived in the light, didn't he? Like Jesus lived. That's how we should live. That's what being Christian means. Christ-like. We know Jesus was full of love and grace and mercy. Therefore, our life should resemble that. We too should be full of love, grace, and mercy. Jesus lived a life of obedience to the Father. He was the perfect Lamb, unspotted. He never sinned. And that's what we need to try to do. Jesus lived a life of service and sacrifice to others. And that's what we need to try to do. We too should try to walk as Jesus walked and live as Jesus lived. <clears throat> Jesus lived a life of spiritual discipline. How many times did we read of him trying to get away from people so he could pray? Get out on his own. He climbed mountains. He got into gardens. He, whatever. He, he tried to get away so he could commune with God and then he'd come right back down having been recharged with his time with God and he would serve the people. He'd minister unto people and he would teach people. We too. If Jesus walked and lived that way, we too need to be living a life of spiritual discipline. Jesus lived a life every day in communication with the Father. So we also should be doing the same thing. In other words, whenever you're going through life and something happens, when in doubt and you don't know what to do, you'll, we used to wear those braces. Just remember to ask yourself, what would Jesus do? What would you do in this situation? Sometimes we have to go to the Word. Was Jesus ever in this situation? What did He do? How did He handle that? That is the life of fellowship with the divine. That is the life of fellowship with the divine. That is how we are supposed to live. And that's what John is preaching to us this evening. And so this concludes the lesson. <clears throat> For those of you who have not been baptized into Christ, you don't have that advocate. You have no one ready to stand up on your day of judgment and say, He's mine. And you need to take care of that. If you are out there and you are, if you have not submitted your life into baptism, you need to respond. Let us know. Study whatever it takes. But you need to get your life turned around so that you can have the advocate in your life. And then we all need to continue to walk with Christ. If you have maybe been walking with Christ and you've stumbled and you need some help, reach out to the elders, reach out to us, whatever your need is, let it be known as we sing this song together. Thank you, Brother Stan, for sharing that lesson with us. I hope you all were encouraged by it as I was. Sing to me of heaven, a song of invitation. Sing to me of heaven, sing that song of peace. From the toils that bind me, it will bring release. Burdens will be lifted that are pressing so. Showers of great blessings or my heart will flow. Sing to me of heaven, let me finally dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me and shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven's sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven as I walk alone, dreaming of the
comrade so long hath gone in a fairer region among the angels throng they are happy as they sing that old sweet song sing to me of heaven let me fondly dream of its golden glory of its pearly gleam sing to me when shadows of the evening fall sing to me of heaven sing the sweetest song of all sing to me of heaven tenderly and low till the shadows o'er me rise and swiftly go when my heart is weary when the day is long sing to me of heaven sing that old sweet song sing to me of heaven let me fondly dream of its golden glory of its pearly gleam sing to me when shadows of the evening fall sing to me of heaven sing the sweetest song of all amen church our brother chris has came forth and it's in dealing with this coronavirus he is going up to Marquette where personnel are afflict, afflicted or have contracted the coronavirus. And he has some uh, concerns, some fears, and rightfully so, because this is an enemy that we can't see, we can't touch, we can't smell, but we know it exists. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray for our brother Chris in regard to his work status and those that he come in contact with at Marquette. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we call on you in times like these. And Father, yes, we are dealing with an enemy that we can't see or touch or smell but we know it exists. And our brother Chris is, is going into a setting at Marquette where he's concerned. He's concerned and fearful of his own life. But well, Father, we pray that you will put a shield around him, that you will allow him to be able to look at you as that refuge, that stronghold that you're able to uh, protect him and guide him. Father, he's not the only one. We as a body are concerned about this because we are fearful of it because we have suspended our services for several weeks because we're concerned that it may uh, be contracted by members of this body. But Father, we realize that our lives are in your hand and we ask that you will protect us. As we look forward to going to uh, another week of life journey, we pray for your protection, your guidance, that we will continue to lean and depend upon you. Go with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.